All right, we're going to get started. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to our webinar hosted by CLASP in partnership with the International Energy Agency. My name is Lexi Ross and I'm a communications associate with CLASP's climate team. We're looking forward to sharing insights from our recently published report, Integrating Appliance Efficiency into Nationally Determined Contributions, as well as looking at how these policies can be effectively implemented. Before we give our presentation today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. Today's session is being recorded and will be available for post-event viewing. I will circulate a recording after the webinar concludes. If you have any questions for the presenters, please use the chat feature in the Zoom meeting. We'll be monitoring the chat and compiling questions for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Lauren Boucher is a research manager supporting class climate and clean energy access portfolios. Lauren has over five years of experience in research and program monitoring and evaluation, previously holding positions with the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, the Global Water Partnership, and Sustainable Energy for All. Lauren holds a master's degree in environmental management and a bachelor's degree in environmental science and political science. Kevin Lane is a social senior program manager at the International Energy Agency, where he oversees the analytical work of the IEA's Energy Efficiency Division. He has almost 30 years of experience working with different governments to develop, implement, and evaluate policies and programs to increase energy efficiency, especially related to energy using equipment. He has supported the development of policies in various countries, including the EU, China, Vietnam, US, and Australia. He has a PhD in statistics and climatology with a postdoctoral research into energy efficiency at the University of Oxford. With that, I will hand it over to Lauren for our first presentation. All right, thank you, Lexi. Um, you can turn it to the next slide, please. Um, before I dive into my presentation, I would like to give our audience an overview of where we're headed for the next 15 minutes. Um, so I've structured this presentation into four parts. Um, first, I'll provide a little bit of context on the state of our environment in light of IPCC's latest assessment report. Next, um, I'll review the potential for appliance efficiency policies to help close the emissions gap between current commitments and what is needed to um, limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And then I'll review key findings from class latest report, integrating appliance energy efficiency into NDCs. And finally, I will review our recommendations for governments. Next slide. So the next decade will be a pivotal moment for climate change. Uh, the IPCC's latest assessment report shows that emissions for all greenhouse gases rose between 2010 and 2019, with average annual emissions higher than previous decades. This report also supported previous research that shows that the pledges in current NDCs um, are insufficient to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. In fact, under current commitments, it is likely that warming will exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius in 2030. Uh, therefore, drastic efforts are needed now um, if we are to achieve uh, the goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, the IPC estimates that emissions must fall between 43% by 2030, and we must stop adding CO2 to the atmosphere altogether by 2050. Um, so a, a clear need for, for action, both in the short and long term. Next slide. Um, and the latest, so just looking back to COP26, um, the latest round of climate commitments at COP26 have helped keep the goal of 1.5 degrees C alive, um, but they're not enough uh, to get us there. Um, if all of the pledges uh, were fully implemented from COP26, um, we could limit warming below two degrees Celsius, um, but we wouldn't meet that 1.5 degree goal. Um, this is illustrated in the graph on the left there, um, and this is from the, the COP presidency um, with data from the Climate Action Tracker. Um, so going into COP27, it's clear that more ambitious commitments are needed long-term um, and short-term. Um, and one outcome of the Glasgow Climate Pact 
was to call our, all parties to revisit and strengthen, strengthen the ambition of their 2030 emissions targets in 2022 at COP27. Um, and it's very important when considering revisions to these 2030 commitments, all countries should plan to employ proven strategies and technologies. And so therefore this creates a large opportunity for appliance energy efficiency. Next slide, please. So when considering what revisions to their NDCs countries should, can, should make, the potential, um, excuse me. So when considering what uh, amendments to NDCs countries should make, um, employing appliance energy efficiency um, can be one uh, added benefit. So appliance efficiency policies can deliver large energy savings that translate to avoided greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they are, they're also a widely used and cost-effective tool, making them an important component of near-term decarbonization efforts. The graph on this slide depicts two scenarios from class appliance and equipment calculator, MEPSI. This shows if MEPS are globally adopted in 2022 for seven product categories, um, and those categories are air conditioning, ceiling and portable fans, electric motors, lighting, refrigerator freezers, space heating, and televisions, we estimate that uh, one gigaton of CO2 emissions could be avoided in 2030. And that's a 9% decrease from the business as usual scenario. Um, more information on these assumptions uh, can be found in the method methodology document linked um, in the MEPSI URL on this slide. Next slide. Separate analysis leading up to COP26 also found that if countries commit to doubling efficiency of, of just four products, those are air conditioners, lighting, electric motors, and refrigerators, um, large savings could also be achieved. Um, so here we're looking at doubling the efficiency of those pro four products in 2030, or by 2030, what the, what the savings would be in that year. Um, so we estimate that about two gigatons of CO2 could be avoided um, in 2030, and that would close the emissions gap by roughly 8%. So these two graphs show the large potential uh, for appliance efficiency to contribute to um, our climate goals. Next slide, please. So in addition to the large benefits in terms of avoided CO2, appliance efficiency policies are also um, uh, an attractive uh, mitigation tool because they're widely used around the world. Um, this map, the maps on this graph show minimum energy performance standards and comparative labeling policies for air conditioners that have entered into force as of May, 2022. Um, and you'll note that the geographic coverage is quite extensive with MEPS spanning 82 geographies and comparative labels spanning 84. And here you'll also note that we've indicated which MEPS and comparative labels are mandatory and which are voluntary as well. And this data comes from the Class Policy Resource Center, um, which is a hub of global efficiency policies spanning 130 geographies. Next slide. And finally, I'd like to touch on another benefit of appliance efficiency policies, and that is they are cost effective. So the IEA constructed a comprehensive review of standards and labeling programs, drawing from nearly 400 published reports and studies spanning 100 countries, and confirmed that appliance efficiency policies are some of the lowest cost options available for reducing energy consumption and associated emissions. Um, and they found the typical society benefit cost ratio um, was four to one for appliance efficiency policies. So you get um, a lot of benefits um, for, for very little cost. Next slide, please. Now moving on to class analysis, um, so our report. So to understand how the benefits of um, how appliance efficiency was integrated into NDCs, um, we reviewed all existing NDCs um, and conducted a keyword search um, of various terms. So to do this, we leveraged WRI's Climate Watch tool, which enables users to search and view NDCs. The results presented in our analysis um, reflect the NDCs present in Climate, Climate Watch prior to December 1st, 2021. 
Um, and then once we you know, had established our, the database we wanted to query, we ran three separate searches. So the first was a broad assessment of how well energy efficiency was integrated into NDCs, and then two separate targeted searches to assess how well appliances in general were integrated into those commitments, as well as specific um, appliance efficiency policies like METs. So to do this, we created a list of relevant um, keywords to search um, using the search feature on WRI's Climate Watch tool. Um, so for example, for appliances, we compiled a list that contained terms such as air conditioners, LED lighting, motors, et cetera. Um, and for specific policies, we compiled a list uh, containing terms such as METs, comparative labels, standards, et cetera. Uh, we then searched all NDCs for those specific keywords. Um, and only the latest NDC was used in our analysis. So for example, if a country has released multiple NDCs or updated them, we only use the most recent NDC. Um, once we had our results, uh, we ran a quality assurance check to ensure the keyword returned um, the appropriate uh, um, subject that we were looking for. Um, and then once we had that, we compiled a list of all countries that met those criteria. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the results of our, our search. Um, and what you'll see here is the majority of countries make references to energy efficiency broadly. Um, so you'll see 80% of parties to the Paris Agreement include at least one reference to energy efficiency in their NDC. However, as our queries became more specific, the number of return results dropped significantly. You'll see that appliances uh, were referenced in just a little over 40% of NDCs, while appliance standards and labeling policies um, were referenced in just over 20%. Um, we also did separate analysis where we cross-referenced um, the, uh, the, the list of countries that did include um, these categories uh, for, sorry, we cross-referenced the list that um, this list with um, results from the Class Policy Resource Center and found that um, a large number of countries that were included in the Class Policy Research Center, meaning they do have um, standards or labeling policies in place, 36% um, of those countries did not reference um, appliance standards and labeling policies in their NDCs. And this trend, as well as the general trend of not um, noting appliances or specific policies in NDCs may reflect um, the tendency for countries to focus on uh, higher level commitments um, and exclude you know, sectoral level targets um, and specific, um, uh, specific avenues for how they'll actually achieve those, um, those high level targets. Next slide. Um, and then, yeah, so how does this all fit into the COP? Um, and appliance, appliances and appliance efficiency policies, um, they're, you know, they're not as popular um, as some other um, options. We see this reflected in conversations um, around the COP every single year where appliance efficiency is often overshadowed um, by, uh, you know, newer or cooler <laughs> topics such as, um, you know, electric vehicles or methane, hydrogen, renewables, et cetera. Um, so by setting clear targets for appliances and directly calling out specific products and policies, um, countries can elevate the status of uh, appliance efficiency onto the global stage and help garner up additional support. Um, so even just including a mention of a product or a specific target um, for a set of products um, can really do uh, quite a lot to, you know, um, create additional priorities and, and really draw attention to the role that these products can play in climate mitigation. Um, and another thing, another benefit of including appliance efficiency targets in NDCs is um, because of the way policies are structured, you can increase ambition over time. Um, and that could align with the ratcheting mechanism within the Clim Paris Climate Agreement. And um, you can compare uh, policies and, and programs across um, multiple economies. Um, so you can you know, compare how 
um, the, the various targets that the different countries are setting. Next slide. Um, I wanted to draw attention to two NDCs. Um, so, so some countries have set clear targets for appliance efficiency. Um, you'll see here that Cambodia and Morocco both indicate the avoided emissions from MEPS in 2030 from lighting and cooling equipment. Um, however, these countries are just two of nearly, uh, of over 200 parties, uh, of nearly 200 parties. Um, and as COP27 approaches, there are um, two steps that that class has identified um, that government should consider going into um, COP27. Next slide, Lexi. So the first step is governments must commit. Um, so they must revise their NDC to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C. And in doing so, um, they should include specific targets for appliances and equipment. So prioritizing the highest impact appliances like refrigeration, space heating and cooling, motors and lighting, et cetera, may be the best place to start. Um, and if possible, these targets should be aligned to international efforts. Um, so one of the outcomes of COP26 was that 14 countries agreed to double global the efficiency of um, four high energy consuming products uh, by 2030. Um, so aligning with you know, those initiatives could be uh, a way for governments to, to think about this topic. Um, and then the second step is to follow through. And that is to work to ensure efficient implementation of policies and programs to ensure that those high level uh, targets for appliance efficiency are met. Um, so that can be done by developing, you know, clear national policy roadmaps with concrete steps and milestones for how those savings will be achieved. Um, and government should also leverage, you know, existing policies and um, tools that are available that help them design um, effective and um, efficient instruments. So, you know, aligning to international test methods, um, using model regulations, et cetera. And with that, um, I will close out the presentation and pass it over to Kevin, who will, oh, sorry, one last slide. Um, uh, <laughs> so this report, um, all of these findings and more can be found in our latest paper. Um, that report is available on CLASS website. If you scan uh, this QR code, um, you can you know, go directly to the landing page where you can download the report. Um, I also wanted to highlight two additional tools uh, mentioned in this presentation. Um, so the first is um, the Class Policy Resource Center, which, I, which again contains uh, efficiency policies for over 130 economies. Um, and then the next tool is METSI, um, which is Class Climate and Energy Impact Calculator, which allows users to model the impacts of um, new efficiency policies um, for a number of different geographies. All right, and that's all for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so we will now be passing the floor to Kevin Lane, who will speak on his experience working alongside governments uh, to implement ambitious appliance efficiency policy. Um, as a reminder, please uh, continue to submit questions through the chat throughout our presentations, um, and we will have a Q&A period at the end. With that, I will hand it to Kevin. Uh, thank you very much, Lexi, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. So, um, so yeah, it was actually really great to see Lauren's presentation as well and see that really uh, good piece analysis of analysis to see um, how much of appliance efficiency is ending up in NDC. So uh, great piece of work and yeah, great to be here. Next slide. So um, before going in, what I'm really going to briefly tell you is a little bit about um, global CO2 and the role of appliance efficiency in there, and then a little bit about policies around appliances and then more about the um, super efficient appliance deployment initiative, which is also looking to strengthen um, the efficiency or improve the efficiency of appliances going forward. Okay, so if we step back and then look at global CO2 emissions, what we're seeing here is just the CO2 emissions from energy combustion and industrial processes. And it's been on an inextricable rise for over a century and longer, of course. Uh, and what we see in 2020, there was actually a big decrease because of the pandemic. It wasn't due to efficiency um, reasons. So we've seen a very big rebound in 2021. So almost two gigatons, so a very substantial rise. So the challenge for us as a society is to try and get this towards net zero by 2050 or as soon as possible. 
So if you go to the next slide, and this is perhaps picking up also what Lauren mentioned earlier, if we look at the um, before Paris, we see that emissions are probably on the trajectory to be rising into the future. But in our stated policy scenario with the IEA, what we expect to happen with current regulations is we're probably plateauing emissions globally with uh, various policies from efficiency, renewables and um, other aspects. Um, leading up to Glasgow at COP26, we saw many countries announcing pledges to try and reduce their emissions further to say where they could um, get to, so maybe net zero by 2050 or shortly afterwards. And there's a few updates around that period as well. So with all those announced pledges, we're probably getting to somewhere about two degrees uh, worth of warming um, that's going to happen. And if we want to get to 1.5 or a chance of 1.5, it really has to be somewhere near net zero by 2050. So what we're seeing here, there's probably two things. In the announced pledges, there's probably not enough detail of how we're going to realize those pledges. So the pledges are being made, but the policies haven't been um, drafted um, explicitly yet. Some countries have, but many haven't. And you've seen a little bit in Lauren's presentation on appliances where this has happened. There's also still another gap to get down to net zero. So there's still more to be done. So there's um, two pieces of policy work that needs to happen, the implementation and going a little bit further. So if we go to the next slide, um, to address some of this, of this to how to get to net zero, the IEA published a roadmap last year. And in there, there was multiple milestones, over 400 of them, to say how you could get to net zero by 2050. There's many ways you can do it, but this is one example. And within there, there was about um, 40 energy efficiency related ones and a few related to products. But the main message is for efficiency, we have to do that very quickly because it is available now, it's not that expensive. So efficiency is one of the key ones to do in the next few years, it has to be front loaded. And of those appliances, motors, uh, cooling equipment, some of those in the next 10 years have to be um, really what's best of class today has to be delivered in the next 10 years or so. So appliances do play a key role and they're very important for short-term action. So next slide. Um, the good news is that policymakers have got a good understanding of what can work in this space. So we do know that minimum energy performance standards, mandatory comparative labels, they are very effective tools in terms of um, improving the efficiency of products. So uh, we've got good experience on how to run these and there's now um, yeah, 80 countries probably using them, almost 100 if you count those that are looking to implement them as well. So half the countries around the world have got some experience of using these policy tools already. And um, if you look at energy consumption, that's probably around 80%. It's quite high for some of the products. So some of the large energy using countries are, um, are already using these tools. So yeah, the key message is we do know the policy tools that do work. And if you go to the next slide, if you, what we did with um, um, our 4E technology collaboration program, we did a review of all the published literature in terms of impact assessments of standards going back over the last 20 to 30 years. And what we see here is that those countries that have used them for a long time, so basically the United States, European Union, for their energy conservation standards, eco design direct, um, directives, so their minimum energy performance standards have been highly effective. So for the energy equipment and those long running programs, they've cut electricity consumption by about 15%, so quite a, a large amount. And it's, um, yeah, maybe uh, it's, yeah, one and a half thousand terawatt hours per annum have already been saved um, just by these particular measures across these countries. And as other countries start to pick them up, these savings will um, grow over time, even just with the existing programs. Next slide. And if you translate some of those electricity savings under carbon, what we've seen, they've also been um, highly effective. So we see very large reductions in carbon, um, certainly in the EU, US, and even China as it starts to roll out more of those. So they're very substantial amounts of carbon. So it's um, hundreds of megatons. So it's well over a gigaton for these countries at the moment over the last few years. And these will only um, grow over time. So you see in the EU eco design for the existing programs, they'll deliver more savings as the stock of appliances get replaced over the next few years. So we, these are very highly effective programs and they probably represent about seven to 10% of CO2 emissions in any particular country. And what's also useful to say is um, 
but they are done at a very low cost. So all of these have been done at probably a net cost to society. So in Lauren's slide, it was showing that the cost, the benefit cost ratio was four to one or so. So the benefits far outweigh the costs. And for individual consumers, they probably weren't paying more and they saved more over the lifetime. So these are basically negative cost emissions, nearly all of those. So they, they are highly effective. So as a society, we should be trying to um, chase these um, carbon mitigation options. Next slide. This one's a little bit more complicated, but what I'm trying to show in here is across the middle, the key policies. In the middle, we've basically got regulations such as minimum energy performance standards, information such as energy labels. Uh, those are our T, uh, two key policies, but incentives can also be useful to try and help people purchase more um, efficient equipment. So in terms of policies, maps and labels are very key ones. Underlying that, you do need some um, supporting elements, whether that's um, monitoring and verification and some compliance activity, but also good test procedures and the like. So there's a lot of um, supporting activity that needs to really be going on um, to make sure that these um, policies do work. However, what I would like to stress that above all of these, what's really important is actually that you have targets and you set out longer term strategies or roadmaps to say, um, where you can be in 5, 10, 15 years time. So, so try give society, industry to give them a clear sense of where efficiency needs to go for their products. Just makes it a lot easier if governments are clear on, on those. So by having roadmaps and including those in say national cooling plans, but also in our nationally determined contributions, that's a very good way of signaling to the market of where you expect efficiency to go. So I probably can't stress that one clearly uh, enough is that these long-term signals are really important and having them in the NDCs is, is, is a very good way of doing that. So I think I'll say next slide. Okay, so shown that um, products are really important, I want to now just very briefly tell you a little about, bit about SEED. So that's a super efficient appliance deployment initiative, which was set up a few years ago under Clean Energy Ministerial and also supported as a task group under the Energy Efficiency Hub. The IEA is the, um, basically managing um, this process at the moment, although we do have some very good partners with CLASP on the line, also the United for Efficiency and the 4E te Technology Collaboration Program. So across those three, they've got some very good resources, very good tools, very good information. So yeah, please do have a look at their websites as well. So in terms of seed, there's over 20 countries at the moment that are partners uh, that are um, uh, engaged with the seed uh, uh, initiative. And if you go to the next slide, uh, the work that it's mainly doing at the moment is, is around sharing knowledge. So just sharing what's good practice amongst uh, the members and wider. Um, we also undertake some research and policy support for the individual countries. And then perhaps the key one that in today's talk is how we can drive ambition and action. And I'll come back to that one in a second. So next slide. In terms of knowledge sharing, we do quite a few webinars um, sharing between different, government, uh, between different governments in terms of the knowledge of what works well and um, sh um, sharing such best practice. Um, we also have some global events as well. So I'll just mention one. Um, on in June, the IA seventh annual global conference on energy efficiency. That will have one session which is looking at appliances, so trying to share good practice there and also how we can drive efficiency. There'll be so, several other checkpoints during the year, but culminating COP27 is another clear milestone for us as well, and to see what we report back at that point. Next slide. Um, in terms of policy support, a lot of it is is dependent on the needs of our government. So we'll clearly be supporting them in terms of research activities, um, giving them evidence or help them support to implement and deliver and drive more energy efficiency policies, and also uh, help in terms of collecting data as well, as well as our partners as well, who do very similar tasks as well, are also part of this, this work. And then I'd like to flick to the final slide, which I think is the most important one in this context. So at COP26 last year, we um, launched something called the Product Efficiency Call to Action, which builds upon us focusing on a few specific products and to see how we could raise the ambition and efficiency of these um, particular products. 
So in there, we had uh, 14 countries signed up to say they would significantly improve their, the efficiency of these products over the um, next year by, to 20, by 2030, say. Um, and then also, um, um, yeah, be more specific on how they could do that. So we'll be working with these countries to see how we can better uh, map what they're doing, um, link it to what other people are doing, and then having some sort of roadmap out to 2030 and just see what's the best way to improve efficiency um, across with these countries, but also others as well. So it's a, they are global products, so they will be global solutions in the end, but we're working with these 14 countries at least on more specifically raising the efficiency of these core products. I think at this slide, if we go to the next slide, yeah, at that point, I'd like to um, say thank you for your attention and hand back to you, Lexi. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, so at this point, we're going to transition to our Q&A session. So if you have any outstanding questions, um, please put them in the chat. And just as a note, any questions that we um, do not address at this time, uh, we'll be circulating a uh, question and answer document along with the recording and the slides. So you will have all of that in the upcoming days. I'm going to stop our screen share. So just to start off, um, Kevin, we have a question for you. Um, so leading up to COP27, what can we expect to see from call to action signatories and the SEED initiative in ensuring that appliance efficiency finds its way into mitigation plans? That's a very good question, Alexi. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess a lot of it really depends what the members would like as well. So we're driven by what our member governments would like as well. But leading up to COP27, we should be having some form of engagement to see what would work with them. So a minimum will be mapping their current activity, what they're planning to do, um, see how it aligns with other countries in the world to see if they're being sufficiently amb ambitious or not. Or indeed, if there's any good practices that they do that we could be transferring to other uh, countries as well. And then what we'd like to be doing um, is to actually um, develop some of these roadmaps to say by 2030, where can you get to, or even a bit longer if, if that's needed. But for this call to action, it was to 2030 we're looking at. So the short term um, imperative on action, how we can raise ambition. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and then our next question is for Lauren. Um, in a similar vein with COP27 quickly approaching, what recommendations do you have for governments in best leveraging appliance efficiency outside of the provisions of the Paris Agreement? Thanks, Lexi. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, all countries were invited to update their NDCs um, in advance of COP27. Um, so all parties who are you know, taking stock of opportunities and considering making those changes should consider um, how appliance efficiency fits into that. Um, as mentioned, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, there were several countries that have um, pretty established appliance standards programs, um, but then did not include uh, or mention appliances or um, any relevant policies in their NDCs. So it can be as simple as making sure that um, the NDC is aligned with existing policies and that appliances are called out specifically. Um, another uh, tool that's available is um, leveraging tools like METSI to understand the opportunity for appliance efficiency within a specific country. Um, so METSI allows users to model specific policy scenarios for different products to see um, what savings could be achieved. Um, and that can be used as a starting point for setting a clear target for appliance efficiency. Um, so I think two things, um, taking stock and, and understanding what's in your NDC and what's not and making sure that, um, you know, current policies and priorities are, are reflected um, within that strategy. And then also if um, appliance efficiency is, is not there, um, using tools and leveraging um, available resources to set an ambitious target um, in the NDC. And then, and then finally working on implementation, but that's a separate thing post COP. Awesome. And Lauren, I have another question for you, kind of encompassing a few different comments that we're hearing. Um, how did you select the appliances that you were going to be um, 
uh, researching in MEPSI and whatnot. Um, I know there's some questions about solar and cooking. Um, what was kind of the drive to uh, select certain appliances? So selecting the list of products, um, that's listed in the report. It's also listed on slide, one of the earlier slides, um, I believe the graph with the results. Um, but we, we basically took a list of um, the products in, in MEPSI um, and then added some additional products, but that, that full product list is available on um, in, in this presentation and that will be um, available after the, the webinar. I see Kevin has yeah. uh, got his hand raised. Yeah, I would probably just add to that. The reason to choose those particular products, I guess, is um, that they are some of the largest consuming um, products that we have in the market. So electric motors, they're just responsible for a, a huge amount of electricity. In many warm countries, air conditioning is a very large amount of um, energy. Also issues of peak loading as well. So they're good ones to regulate. Lighting is the other one as well. It's a very large one. And refrigerators. So these are maybe just because historically they account for a lot of energy consumption. And then also perhaps there's some very good experience on how they can be regulated well. So many countries have already gone through the process. It's very quick and easy for governments to pick up on these. So the international testing procedures are in place. We, we just know how to regulate them well and we collect good data on these. So they're the, maybe the quicker, easier wins to regulate or to get good policy in place. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you both. Um, Kevin, a question for you. Um, are there any programs targeted at a bottom up approach to encourage local governments to develop uh, roadmaps and policies within uh, their jurisdictions? Yeah, it's a good one. In, in efficiency, yeah, we do look at all levels of government are probably needed um, to make things work. For appliance efficiency, there's a little one part is a little bit different. If we're looking at minimum energy performance standards, usually they have to be done at the national level or sometimes even larger. So um, because they usually traded goods within a region, so you can't really have different levels within, within a region. You can't have one city saying what this level, another city saying what this level if they traded goods. So you usually see that for maps and maybe even for labeling, that the standards or the requirements are the same within a country or even in a region, say ASEAN, or within um, the North America Free Trade Agreement or within um, all of the EU, they've all got the same regulations. However, I think there's still a role at the subnational government and there could be things like local governments, they procure a lot of equipment. So I think procurement standards could be set locally. It could be based on energy labels. It could be based on say energy style. It could be based on those. So governments have got a role in terms of what they procure, local governments. Um, perhaps also advertising or promoting some of the national schemes as well. There could be some local uh, context that is better promoted locally. They can also perhaps um, fund some if, uh, energy efficiency appliance as well. So maybe there might be local programs as well, whether that's funding upfront costs or um, other issues as well, and also information. So I think there are, is a role for local governments, but the real... MEPS part, I think, has to be done at a national level. Thank you so much. Um, another question for Kevin. Um, do we know how efficiency levels are targeted under the seed uh, call to action compare with the levels in model regulations, for example, uh, lighting, ACs, refrigerators? Um, yeah, so the model regulations you're talking about, I uh, assume these are the United for Efficiency. They've actually developed some, some very good um, example regulations which are built on existing ones. So they're very good templates for countries that are new to regulations, just follow those. In terms of those, there's usually a few um, tiers within there as well. So as part of our mapping, we've looked at the potential levels that are in the model regulations. Some of them are dated and now would probably get updated again. So we would um, as a first step, look to at least align with what's in those model regulations or align with what's in existing regulations. Um, so, um, yep, uh, to, and then it also depends what the countries are going to commit to over the next few years as well. But in an ideal world, it would be linked to what's in existing regulations. It wouldn't 
go off and develop new levels or new test standards that should be built on existing testings and also performance levels. Thank you. And then a final question for both of you. Um, what resources are available to policymakers who want to engage uh, with uh, increasing efficiency in their uh, NDCs? Can we go first, Lauren? Sure. Um, so class has a number of tools that I touched upon. Um, so we have MEPSI, which is the um, class appliance and um, Appliance Impact Calculator, um, where you can model specific policies um, at the national level. Um, and um, there are a number of updates that CLASS has planned for this year, um, including um, in integrating uh, refrigerants, as well as um, extending the model beyond 2030. Um, so those are all planned for the, the future. Um, and we also have the Class Policy Research Center, um, Resource Center, which is a database of um, uh, efficiency policies. Um, and those span um, a number of products. They also include um, uh, policies for, for off-grid energy products, as well as uh, water efficiency policies. Um, and those policies span uh, 130 geographies. I uh, will just add to that then to say, yep, so if you're new to the space or even if you're not new to it, certainly do look at CLASS. We do provide a lot of tools and information as well. So I think some of your market assessments are also uh, very useful as well. So uh, yep, certainly look at those. Um, um, the United for Efficiency, they've got some good resources as well in terms of looking at um, yeah, country saving assessments, um, looking at the model regulations. Uh, the 4E Technology Collaboration Program I mentioned earlier, they're a collection of um, countries that have done a lot in this space, so they publish a lot of their experience on websites and also what's cutting edge for them in terms of where um, product policy could go next, so they're also a good uh, website or good resource to, to look at as well. And I'd mention perhaps one other one, so the IEA, we've also got our Policies and Measures Database, which is um, perhaps a wider one than just appliances, but that's a useful one. The last week we were doing some, we had a training week where we had over 200 people from Latin America and we were taking them through the various stages of how to uh, implement product efficiency in terms of maps, labels, evaluation and the rest. So that's very intensive, but that was a whole one week course and we're looking to put that online as well. So that should be a good online resource as well if you're new to the area and want to um, see what's good practice in terms of um, implementing product policy. Thank you so much. And with that, we will uh, wrap up our webinar. Thank you so much, Lauren and Kevin, for uh, your presentations and thoughtful answers. And thank you to all participants for joining and engaging with us with questions and feedback throughout the webinar. Um, as a reminder, we will circulate a recording of this event with slides. Um, in the next few days, as well as a question and answer document um, to address any outstanding questions. Um, and with that, thank you all and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.